my name is Rob Shapland. I work as an ethical computer hacker. So my job basically is to hack into companies, um, show them how it's done, and then help them defend against it. Uh, and it kind of takes a few different forms. So I do cyber purely technical based hacking. Um, and then I also do something called social engineering, which is basically hacking people in a way. Um, so one of my specialties is to do something called physical intrusion or social engineering of buildings. So I'll dress up in various different outfits and try and trick my way past security guards, receptionists. So I might dress up as a, a lift technician or the guy that's coming to fix the coffee machine or deliver the paper for the printer or whatever I think will work. Um, and then get into the building. And when I'm in, I'll bring with me a small, uh, we call it a drop box. It's basically a mini tiny PC made out of a Raspberry Pi computer. Uh, we put a case around it, a little black case. It says property of IT, please do not remove. Um, we then try and find somewhere to plug it in. So I'll break into the building, find somewhere to plug this device in. Once it's in place, it then kind of dials out back to my office. And now we have access to that company's computer network as if we'd broken in. Um, so it kind of bypasses the need to do a phishing attack and all those sorts of things and actually hack because you just place this device straight into the network and you're there acting as if you're an employee of that company effectively. Uh, so it's a really, really good and effective way of breaking into companies and it's also really, really good fun. Um, when we combine everything together like this and we, we target a company, we, we break in, we plant this device, we then hack their network, we call it red teaming. Um, which is kind of the, the next level of, of ethical hacking, which is it's taken from a military term, but it's really, really good fun. Uh, it's very interesting, it takes place over the course of a few months where we plan and, and execute attacks against companies. And we usually go after like their crown jewels, their most important files or data or whatever we're trying to steal, whatever we think would be the most important to them, we'll try and get that and then show them how they did it. The idea being then we can send them a report and videos and things showing them how we broke in, they can fix all those holes, they're then better defend against hackers in the future. And then we come back and do it next year. We try the new techniques that have been developed, different ways in, they learn again, they upgrade the defenses again, and we go on and on and on. You imagine if you do this over a few years, the company is very, very good at defending itself. So that's kind of the idea behind it. Uh, alongside that, I do do a bit of media work, as, as you mentioned. Um, I've done some media work for Sky News, BBC, ITV, basically commenting on, on cybersecurity issues and trying to bring it into context about what people need to do, how to defend against it, and how much how risky it actually is. So a bit later on, I'll talk about the TravelX ransomware attack that, that happened back in January and, and how that was done and what the impact was. Um, so overall in this presentation, I want to run people through the main the main methods that hackers use to access computer systems and target companies, why it's so effective, how, many, how they make money out of it and how you can defend against it. Um, so we've got four main topic areas which kind of reflect um, those things I just talked about. So social engineering is the first one. Social engineering underpins nearly all hacks in some form. So taking advantage of people. It's quite rare for hacks to purely involve technical side. Normally you have to trick someone into clicking on a link for you, opening an attachment, opening a door, um, saying something over the phone they shouldn't do, that sort of thing. I'll start with that and then talk about how that feeds into phishing attacks and go through some of the recent ones of those. Um, when you do talk about technical attacks, one of the key things and the, the main ways that hackers break in is to use weak passwords. Even if I'm on the network, so I've broken into the building, I've put the device onto the network. In order to get anywhere on that network, I have to know someone's password and I become them and then I use their access to steal the information. When people have weak passwords, it makes that, that much simpler. Uh, and then I'll quickly talk through who actually does these hacking attacks, why they do it and what the impact is from their success. Um, okay, so first topic is my favorite thing to talk about, which is social engineering. Um, now, for people who don't know of this term, it does mean hacking people, taking advantage of, of people in a company. Um, it's quite rare, as I said, for most for attacks to be purely technical. We usually use some form of social engineering, be that an email, in person, a telephone call, etc. Um, and I want to tell you a, a quick story um, of a building that we broke into uh, using social engineering, um, just to show you how effective it can be. Um, so when we are asked by a company to break into one of their, their buildings, they always give us a certain goal or objective. And it's usually, can you get onto our computer system and steal a file from there? Or it might be, can you physically put a computer under your arm once you've broken in and walk out with it and see if anyone says anything? Um, and in this case, it was a, a pharmaceutical company that had developed a new drug and they wanted to see whether it was possible for us to break into one of their buildings, get on the computer network and steal plans or designs for that, that drug and then get out without getting caught. 
Um, so first thing we do when we're contacted is um, well, we get legal consent, first of all. It's a very important part of it. We get a form written and, and signed off. Second thing we do is we start to plan how we're going to do this attack. So we imagine that we've, we've been given the name of the company and now we're going to do a load of Googling and find out about that company. So we're going to look at the company's website. Uh, we're going to look on company's house. We're going to try and find blueprints, designs for the building that they occupy. We're going to try and find out who the landlord is. Is it a shared building? Can we get photographs of it? Uh, we'll go onto Google Maps and pop into Street View mode to have a look around the building. Uh, we'll now go onto social media for the company, so the company's official social media channels. Can we see photos of staff wearing ID badges that we can then create copies of and pretend to be an employee? Um, can we then look on LinkedIn and see who works at the company? So just type in the company name, it shows all the employees that work there. Now we look through that list of employees. Now we can go to those employees' Instagram pages, um, Facebook pages, Twitter pages, start to build up a profile about them. Maybe they've posted some photos from inside the office. Maybe they're wearing their ID badges and some photos and we can use that against them. Or perhaps we can find out something they're interested in and, and use that as part of a targeted phishing attack. Um, now, in the case of the company we were targeting, they had, after a bit of research, we found out they had about 14 offices located around the UK. Um, so we thought, okay, we'll, we'll target the office that looks the least secure. That's what a real criminal would do. And in most companies, if you get into one building, you've, you're sort of interconnected to all the other networks around, around the offices. Um, and we found an office just on a, on a high street in a small town. Now, the great thing about a high street is uh, there's lots of foot traffic going past there. It can't really have fences and security patrols and things like that. So it's hopefully quite an easy target. Now, the next thing we do is we go there in person and we do an in-person reconnaissance. So we get there at 6.37 in the morning, we do a kind of stakeout like you see in the movies, you get some donuts and you kind of watch what's going on. Um, so we're looking for um, how many different entrances and exits to the building are there? Um, where are they located? Could we sneak in a back door, for example? Uh, what do people wear to work? Do they wear a suit and tie? Do they wear casual clothes? Is it some sort of uniform? Uh, do they have an ID badge? If they do, what does that look like? And if we haven't got photographs from the social media research, we'll take a photograph take that back to our office and use a machine to print off the badge and lanyard and any style and design that we need. Uh, even better, if we can actually approach someone wearing one of those badges, just walk past them. Um, we've got a device called an RFID cloner, which can actually copy their badge. So get within half a meter or so, walk past them, it clones their badge. We can then go to the office where they work and unlock the security doors and things using the device. Uh, if we've got time in between, which we usually will, we can transfer the signal from the, bad, from the device onto the badge we've created. So imagine I've got a fake ID badge with the real person's name uh, or, or my fake name if I wanted to, my photo, the design, the correct design for that company. And I've got, um, and it works on the scooter systems and I'm wearing the right clothes. In a large company, that's very, very difficult to, to stop. Um, in a small company, it's a bit more difficult because everyone knows everyone that works there. So I can't just turn up and sit down and pretend I've always worked there. Uh, and this was the case in this company, the office we were targeting, judging from all the foot traffic we'd seen, there's about 20 to 25 people working there. So I can't just rock up and pretend I work there. So what we need now is to develop a valid pretext or reason for being there. So some sort of visitor we're going to come in as. So that could be the things I talked about earlier, like lift technician, coffee machine guy, environmental auditor, courier, all those sorts of things. Now, the pretext you choose has to match up with what you're going to do once you're inside. And I need to get onto the computer network. So I can't dress up as the coffee machine guy because the coffee machine guy wouldn't sit down and bring out a laptop and start working away. So I decided to dress up as a BT engineer. Um, so I get a high-vis yellow jacket. I um, print the, the BT logo onto the back of it. Um, I have a box full of uh, cables and tools. I've got a clipboard with some work reference numbers on it and things like that. And I've even got an ID badge um, for BT. And I got that ID badge by going to, um, going to LinkedIn, searching for BT engineers, finding someone with a bit of a weird name because I need to find them on Instagram. And if they're called John Smith, it's going to be impossible. Um, scroll through that person's photos, went back a couple of years, found a photo of him wearing his full uniform, holding his badge up to the camera. So something like first day at BT, so proud. Um, so I thought, okay, brilliant. I've got a nice got a valid ID that badge for the day, so I can use that. Printed that out. Now I've got a very valid looking outfit. 
now I just need to act like that BT engineer. So this is where it's kind of more similar to acting in some ways than, than technical hacking. Um, so I turn up at this building, you go inside, there's just a reception desk on the right with receptions behind it. On the left is a foyer area and then behind the reception desk is a, is a lift up to the top floor where I presume their office space is. Um, so I casually go up to the reception desk and say, um, hi, I'm here from BT. Um, I've got an appointment booked in um, to visit you today to resolve some network connectivity issues you've been having. Um, shouldn't take more than half an hour. Do you, do you mind if I just sign in and run upstairs? Um, and she looked down at her list and now they had a, a guest book of expected visitors for that day. And of course I wasn't on there. Um, so she looked down and, and was a bit confused and said, look, I'm really sorry, but I haven't had a phone call from head office to authorize this visit. I'm going to need to speak to someone over there to, to check you're supposed to be here. Um, were you given a contact name um, when you were given the job? Uh, and I said, yeah, I was a guy called Adam from your IT department. Um, now I picked Adam on purpose and he was a real employee of the company um, because as part of the research, I'd gone on to various employees, Facebook pages and Instagram and Twitter. And I found on Adam's Facebook page, he hadn't restricted his profile settings correctly. So I could see quite a few of his photos and status updates and things, not everything, but, but quite a few. Um, and I've been on his profile on the morning of the test, just have a look. Uh, and it turned out he checked in at Gatwick Airport that morning saying he was flying somewhere. I can't, can't, can't remember where it was. Um, now, the great thing about that is now I knew he wouldn't be contactable. So if I give over his name, she'll try and get hold of him, won't be able to. And then I can just hopefully lay, keep laying on the pressure and she'll just let me in anyway. So that's the plan. Um, so she tries to phone him, can't get hold of him, leaves him a voicemail message. Uh, she comes back to me. I'm just sat in the foyer and she says, look, really sorry, but I can't get hold of Adam. Um, but I can't just let you in on your say so. I'm really sorry. I'm going to need to speak to him before I can let you in. So I have to wait for a call back from him. I'll keep calling him. Um, but also, do you, would you mind giving him a call and, you know, see if we can speed this up, see if you can get it through. Uh, here's his phone number. So she gives me the, the phone number and I, I walk out of the building and I think, OK, I can probably work with this. And I wait about 10, 15 minutes, phone up my office and say, can one of you guys phone in and pretend to be Adam? Chances are she won't know his voice. He's from the head office. We can convince her that this guy's Adam and it's okay to let the BT engineer in, then maybe the plan's still going to work. Um, so one of the guys volunteers to do it, phones up, um, says, have you got a BT engineer there with you? At which point I come back into the, to the building. She says, oh yeah, he's just come back in. Is it okay to let him in? Um, and, and my guy says, yeah, it's absolutely fine to let him in. Um, We've got a huge network problem at the moment. We don't even know if it's your end. It might be, it might be our end, but we've sent him over there first. Do you mind getting him in straight away? And she says, yeah, yeah, no problem. Um, so she signs me in the guest book, takes me upstairs, um, sits me down. Um, uh, and there's an IT person working in this building. Now, that's the last thing I want now is an IT person to be sat next to me while I'm doing this hacking. Uh, and he's a bit confused about why I'm there and, and doesn't really understand. Um, so we have a chat for a while um, and he, he says, you know, are you sure you need to be here? Because the weird thing is we don't even use BT here. Um, but I suppose if you're here, you might as well carry on. So even though I got some of the research wrong, you still let me, me carry on. Um, and I needed to get some time away from him. So I asked for a cup of coffee and, and some other bits and pieces, glass of water, trying to buy time. And he came back and said, I'm really sorry, I've got a meeting for the next hour. Do you mind if I leave you on your own? I was like, no, no, that's absolutely fine. That's great. So he left me on my own. So I got an hour on the computer network, which is enough time for me to hack in um, and sort of steal the, the plans they wanted to. Um, well, I didn't actually steal them. I just took a screenshot showing that I had them. Um, and then get out of the building and, and job's done. Um, so with a very simple, you know, dress up as a BT engineer, a little bit of a convincing story, get into the building. Now their network security, once you're inside, was terrible, which was why it only took an hour. And in reality, for most companies, it would take a lot longer than that. And you might be talking days, weeks, even months for a very well-defended company. But once you're on the network, if you know what you're doing, you will get what you want. It's just a matter of your, your skill level. The, the hard bit is the initially getting in without getting without getting caught so by doing this physical intrusion um, in my experience of doing this this hundreds of times it makes it very likely that you will get in uh, and it's again yeah, it's really really good fun to to do as well um now in that story i mentioned social media a couple of times i talked about the facebook page of adam that allowed me to find out that he was on holiday i talked about the bt engineers instagram page that meant i could use their id badge uh, and this is always where it starts. The first thing we do with targeting companies and when criminals are targeting real life companies for real life attacks, they will use social media because it's the biggest source of information about a company. It's simple to go onto LinkedIn, search for the company name. It says, see all 500 employees, a company. You click on that and you've got a list of employees for that company. 
Now you can immediately just convert those names into email addresses. First name dot last name at company name dot com is the format nearly every company uses. So now you can just have a whole bunch of 500 email addresses ready to go. So now you can target them with a phishing attack, perhaps something simple pretending to be the IT team. So you say, uh, we're switching over to a new version of Microsoft Outlook next week. Please check your username and password work on the following link. And you use a very you know, valid looking signature that maybe you've emailed them and waited for them to respond. Then you steal the signature from the bottom of the email. And that's going to have you know, a decent success rate. People are going to respond to that and you will get a few passwords. Once you've got a few passwords, you start to log into systems and now you're, now you're in the network. Um, the only problem with that is if you email 500 people pretending to be the IT team, it's quite loud. You know, people will recognize that they report it as phishing attacks and you end up emailing the IT team pretending to be the IT team, which doesn't work very well. So a better thing to do is to go back to LinkedIn and choose three, four, five people to target. And what we're looking for is people that match certain criteria. So I want someone that has only just joined the company, so doesn't really understand perhaps the procedure for escalating phishing attacks, is maybe easily influenced by authority. I'm looking for someone who works in a customer facing type role who's used to responding to requests quite quickly but most importantly i'm looking for someone that's got open social media profiles so they've got an instagram page that's open to everyone twitter that's the same facebook page maybe other profiles and things as well um, now that often means i end up targeting people early to mid 20s often that work in the marketing department and the good thing about targeting people that work in the marketing department is they have access to social media during the day so a lot of companies will block social media access but they can't for marketing departments because it's part of their job. So I know they'll have access to social media and be using it during the daytime. Um, now what I'm going to do is I'm going to go through their profiles and kind of stalk them really, just go through all their photos, messages, etc., trying to build up a profile about them so I can design a phishing attack specific to that individual. Uh, we call it a spear phishing attack. Um, so my favorite one to use is uh, holiday photos. Well, obviously, ironically, no one can go on holiday at the moment. Um, but previously, if someone went skiing, for example, um, I could go through their holiday photos looking for the name of the ski resort they went to or the, the hotel they stayed in. Um, and perhaps I can find it in the background of a photo or it's tagged, something like that. Now what I'm going to do is go to that hotel's website, find, find that, copy its font, logo, etc. Send an email that looks like it's come from that hotel to that person saying, um, hi, uh, we, we hope you had a lovely time in our hotel a couple of weeks back. We think you may have left some valuables in your room. Please see attached a couple of photographs. Let us know if they're yours or not. Now it's quite a convincing hook. So the person opens up the photograph, issues a picture of some earrings, um, uh, and they close it down and reply and say, no, they're not mine. However, they have opened up an email, email attachment, which is exactly what I wanted them to do. And within the code of that image, I was able to hide a virus that gives me access to their computer. So now I have complete control and can do whatever I want with that, including seeing everything they're doing, taking away all their taking all their passwords, um, turning on their webcam and watching them if I really want to, all sorts of things, just because they double clicked on this attachment. So that's all what phishing is about, is getting them to, to interact with an link or an attachment. So we're making it specific to that individual, it much increases the chance that they'll they'll interact with it and decreases the chance that they'll actually report it to anyone because it doesn't actually look suspicious. Um, so the first tip I can give people, because this is how a lot of attacks start, they start with social media, whether it's against you as an individual to, to do identity theft and steal uh, bits about your life or whether it's to target you through uh, your company through you, minimizing your exposure online. You know, I'm not saying you have to remove social media profiles, but restricting access to them using the built-in privacy settings, which work very well, is a great way of doing it. So Facebook has an option called limit past posts under the privacy settings. It means everything you've ever posted, once you click on that, will only be accessible to friends. If you've never clicked on that, I will be able to see not everything about you, but some bits. Uh, Twitter and Instagram both have options, meaning that if I want to view your message of the photos, I have to request access. So you can then check if you know that person. Um, and there are various running apps and things that may track where you're going and things, and they all have privacy settings, Strava being one of the biggest ones. So my advice, just don't stop using social media if it's part of your life, but do restrict how it's used and who can access it. Uh, and it won't affect your enjoyment of the platforms. It just means that people who have malicious purposes can't, uh, can't do anything. Okay, so defending against physical attacks, as I've talked about in that story, there are a few things you can do. So if you work for a company, a um, few things that work really, really well. So first one, making sure visitors are accompanied. So in that story, when I went as a BT engineer, if the IT guy had actually sat with me for the duration, 
I couldn't have actually done any of the stuff I'd wanted to do. He'd known I was up to no good. Um, visitors should be easily distinguished by being signed in and wearing visitor badges. Um, staff within companies always encourage people to take a little bit of responsibility. If you see someone walking around with a high-vis jacket carrying a ladder or whatever, it doesn't mean they're supposed to be there just because they look like they belong. If they've not got one of those badges, then, then highlight it to reception staff. And one of the easiest ones for people to do is just to watch for people following in behind you. If you've got a swipe thing for a door and then you open it, that's there to protect it from people who don't have that. So don't just let people in behind you if you don't know who they are. Just turn around and say, look, I'm really sorry, but I'm not allowed to do, let you in. Um, you'll have to use your own card or knock on the door and, and the reception will let you in. So just close it behind them. That's one of the most effective deterrents because most of the time when I'm doing these attacks, you know, I talked about that reasonably complicated story the bt engineer honestly most of the time all i do is hang around outside doors wait for people to come out and then follow them in and that's it job's done and um, once you're inside a large office no one bats an eyelid as long as you don't act like a criminal um okay so the talk about social media neatly links me into a bit more detail about phishing attacks so i talked to you about spear phishing attacks that use um information taken from social media this is the most effective type uh, and all we need to do is get you to click on a link or an attachment. So common ones are Excel spreadsheets, Word documents, PDFs, uh, zip archive files, those sorts of things. Um, and the criminals are quite clever in the way they do it. Um, so one I saw recently was a, a spreadsheet um, and the email said, um, uh, please see attached. Uh, it was like it was a, an email accidentally sent to everyone in the company or looked like it was accidentally sent. Um, and it said, hi, Julie, please see attached a spreadsheet containing uh, salary increases and bonus payments for this financial year. Um, and it's accidentally been sent to everyone in the company. So people get quite curious. They want to know what's in this spreadsheet. They want to see what they're being paid, what their bosses are being paid, uh, what their friends are being paid. So they double click on it um, and it doesn't work. There's all, it's all like mangled words and things on the spreadsheet. But the top it, in, in, a yellow, in, in yellow writing, it says, um, if you cannot read the contents of this spreadsheet, please click enable macros. Now, enabling macros is what makes the virus run in the background and, and give the hacker access to your computer. Um, so they're quite clever, very uh, convincing hooks. And it's all about getting you to have some sort of emotional reaction to the email, whether that be fear, uh, curiosity, anger. Um, so common ones you'll see are, are invoices from Apple for something you haven't bought. So you get angry. That Apple have charged you for something. Perhaps you think the kids have got hold of the phone and they've, they've bought something they shouldn't have done. So you get angry, but there's a link at the bottom of the email that says, if you've not authorized this purchase, please click here. So you click on the link without thinking, you fill in your Apple login, and now the hackers have that. And now you know, they know most people share passwords across multiple websites. So now they log into your bank with the same password, for example. Um, so there's a very uh, effective way of doing it is to force, uh, trying to trick people into having this emotional response to an email. Um, Unsurprisingly, at the moment, the most common types of phishing attacks are to do with coronavirus, whether that is offering you some sort of cure, whether it's um, some sort of scaremongering, um, alerts, details about people who've been infected in your area as if there was like a list that you could click on and that sort of thing. There's loads and loads and loads of these going around at the moment because it's topical and hackers will always do this. They always keep up with the latest things that are going on, design phishing attacks around it. Um, get you to click on the link or the attachment and then they have access to your computer or to your personal details. Um, now one of the things they can do, so they may just steal things straight from your computer, but one of the best ways of making money is to use something called ransomware. Now the most famous usage of this was the, the one that really really hurt the NHS a few years back when they got encrypted with ransomware, uh, but very recently you may have heard of the, the Travelex ransomware attack that took down Travelex um, travel money company during the new year period. <clears throat> and what the hackers actually did is they took control of computers on Travelex's network well in advance, did all sorts of things to, to find information and things. Then on New Year's Eve, late into the evening, because they knew no one would be working there at that time, they triggered a ransomware attack to happen. They were already on the network, so they just ran it like you'd run in the other file. And it went around the whole network and started encrypting everything stored on those computers. So then when they came on in the morning, nothing worked. And you just had a big message pop up on the screen saying you've been infected by ransomware. You must pay a ransom fee. Now, there's been various different stories of how much that ransom fee was, but it's thought to be around $6 million was the, the demand. And they'll demand it in a currency like Bitcoin um, or something, some other cryptocurrency. Um, 
If you pay that ransom fee, they usually will unlock all your data and give you access back. Not always, but, but usually. Um, if you don't know what you're doing, you don't know how to buy Bitcoin, all those things. Some of them even have a, a phone number you can call and you get through to a call center and they will talk you through it. And they'll be one of the most helpful call centers you'll ever speak to. Um, they'll answer on the first ring. They support lots of different languages. Uh, they'll run you through how to unlock your files. <coughs> um, even at the end of the phone call, some of them will give you a customer satisfaction survey to check you were happy with the service you received. Um, so they're very, very professionally run outfits, uh, but they make huge amounts of money. Um, so as I said, Travelex, no one knows whether they paid a ransom fee, um, but lots and lots of companies will do because it ends up being cheaper than trying to get your files back. Um, now you're relying on having backups of your data and then you can restore it and get the damaged files back. Still expensive though, still takes time to do that. And some sophisticated ransomware will try and target the backups first, destroy those, then encrypt the main network and then ask for the ransom fee. Um, so TravelX, um, massive amount of disruption, cost them millions and millions and millions of pounds. Um, so a very, very effective attack. Um, another one that was hit is a company called Norsk Hydro. Now, Norsk Hydro um, had all their manufacturing equipment uh, disabled by a ransomware attack and basically had to go and rebuy a load of it. And it costs them about £45 million in total. Um, so these attacks are very, very effective ways of making money or causing disruption to companies. Um, they're actually probably the, the most effective along with another type of attack that I'll talk about uh, in a sec, which is this one. Um, so second type of attack is a method of tricking a finance employee within a company to make a money transfer for you via a phishing attack. So we send an email to someone who works in the finance department that can make money transfers. And we pretend to be the chief financial officer or the, or the chief executive officer. So CEO or CFO. Um, we say, we, we use a couple of social engineering techniques. So what we do is we say, we're only available for a few minutes and this payment must be made now. Um, now, the techniques we're using are authority, so we're pretending to be someone in authority, which is a proven technique that will make people respond faster and, and more frequently. Uh, and we also pretend we've only got a few minutes before we're not going to be available, so once technical scarcity. So we send an email saying, hi, I'm at the airport at the moment, completely forgot to pay a supplier invoice. Uh, it's due urgently this afternoon, but I'll be on my, on my flight. Can I leave this and trust this with you to deal with it while I'm out? Now, that's coming from someone from a position of authority, puts a lot of, um, a lot of emphasis on it. And it's hard for that junior finance person to, to resist that if they don't think they can get hold of that person. Now, they should, of course, just pick up the phone and speak to them um, uh, and using a phone number they haven't got from that email. Um, but a lot of times they just fall for it and will transfer money. Now, a company called Pathé Theatres, I uh, often see on cinema screens, they fell for this. They transferred half a million pounds out of the company on a Friday afternoon when the normal payments are being made. And the hackers thought, okay, well, we're probably authorized on their finance systems now. So if we request more payments, they'll probably just go through without any authorization. So the following Friday, the same thing after another half a million pounds and it worked and they kept doing it. And they did it for 36 weeks in total and they got 18 million pounds out of the company before they realized what had happened. <laughs> so a huge impact on that company's uh, operations uh, and huge loss of money as well. So a very effective attack. Uh, now, defending against that, that specific one is, is really common sense. You know, pick up the phone, talk to the CFO or the CEO, uh, don't respond and, and do money transfers, just based on an email. Um, an extension of that attack, once you start to get procedures in place to stop this, is just to pretend to be a client. So let's say I, um, I run a company and I have a stationary company that supplies all sorts of stationery into me. Um, and I might have a, a standing order with them that I spend a thousand pounds with them a month. Um, now what I do as the hacker is I hack into the stationary company's email account. The stationary company's probably not gonna have a lot of money. They're not gonna know a lot about cybersecurity defense. So they're an easy target. We break into their email by guessing a password or using a phishing attack. We then send an email to the other company saying, um, we're updating our bank account details to the following. And we're using their real email address, so it's quite convincing. The other company updates the bank account details, and now that £1,000 a month or, or whatever, you know, you can scale it up to £500,000 a month if it's a big company for different types of services, starts being transferred to our bank account. So we've got a very easy to do attack that uses a real email address, so it's quite hard to spot. Now tips for avoiding these attacks. 
the main thing is think about what the email is asking you to do. Is it triggering some sort of emotional reaction in you? Is it making you angry, fearful, sad? Uh, does it use urgency? Um, uh, is there, are there spelling mistakes in the body of the email? Does the email address itself look wrong? Does it use generic greetings like hi, uh, dear sir, or something like that, rather than being directed straight to you? Um, does it use a different ending on the email address and where you'd expect apple.com? Does it use um, apple.net or something like that? Is it slightly different in some way? If you're in any doubt, if it looks at all suspicious, but you're just not sure, the best thing to do is to, to find out where you need to send it to within the company you work for, send it to them and they can, their IT department can, can look at it um, for you or they can get in contact with a company like mine to, to help out and see whether it's a phishing attack. If in any doubt, do that. Even if you've already clicked on it, still report it because we might be able to block it before it does any damage. Okay, so two good ways of attacking companies are physical intrusion of their buildings and phishing attacks. Once we're on the network, or if we're just going to guess passwords over the internet, people's weak passwords are one of the best ways to break in. This slide here shows uh, just how bad people choose passwords. This is a recently updated slide in the last couple of months. Uh, 123456 is the most popular password on the internet at the moment, uh, followed by password and a few other very, very weak ones. Uh, now, in the next slide, I'm going to show you a choice of seven different passwords. Um, now, just have a think for a few seconds about which one you might think is the best password, and then I'll reveal which ones are good and why. Okay, so there's a choice of seven different passwords there. I'm sure there are a few of them that you'd recognize aren't very good. Obviously, number one, Maggie one, not a very good password. It's obviously just a name and a number. It's not very long. Um, that is how most people choose their passwords, though. They will pick their pet's name, the favorite football team, um, their, their partner's name. They put a number at the end because most corporate password systems make you have a capital letter in the number. Uh, and then they make you change your password every 60 or 90 days. So you just make it Maggie 2 and then Maggie 3 and then Maggie 4 and then Maggie 5 and so on. I broke into um, an email account of a, a large company's CEO um, a couple of months back and his password was password24. So he'd been there for about eight years just changing that password every every three months to two, three, four, five, six, etc. Um, so there are a couple of techniques that hackers use to guess your password. The first is called a brute force, which is about as dumb as it sounds, but basically we try and guess every possible combination of numbers, letters, and symbols that the word could be. So Maggie one is seven characters long. So first thing we try is seven A's, six A's and a B, six A's and a C, and so on. And so we've run through every possible combination, but that's quite slow. If you think about it, there's 26 characters on the keyboard, then there's the numbers and there's the symbols. So let's say there's 60. So you've got 60 for the M, 60 for the A, so that's 60 times 60 times 60 times 60. It's a huge number. But a decent laptop nowadays can run through those combinations about a billion times per second. So that's very quick as well. So this is how long it takes to break those passwords. So Maggie one's weak, as, as we already talked about. <coughs> uh, Jeremy, pretty weak as well. Now, a lot of people would have gone for number three, I would imagine, because it's what you're kind of trained previously to think a good password looks like. It's got numbers, letters, symbols, that sort of thing. It's complex. However, it's not long enough. That's the key. It's only eight characters long. It is not long enough to prevent a brute force attack by uh, even, even a single laptop for that long. If you think about using a group of laptops instead, it comes even quicker. Um, number four is the longest against this technique. Now, this pass, this Guessing technique isn't clever. It's not trying to guess words. It's just going for every possible combination. Therefore, whatever has the most letters is going to be the, the strongest against this technique. There is another technique coming up. But that's using a single laptop computer. Real criminal gangs use huge collections of computers known as botnets. Usually what they've done is they've hacked a load of personal home computers where people don't realize they haven't got any antivirus software. Um, and then they can just kind of pull them all together like a big supercomputer and you can hire them. So there are criminal groups that will hire you these botnets for about $50 an hour. It's not very expensive. Um, so you have 10,000, maybe even a hundred thousand computers all working together. Now, number three, which a few people would have gone for, I'm sure, um, is actually defeated in about a minute and seven seconds. So it's effectively useless as a password against any criminal group that would look to break into a company. Anyone that survives is I love green tomatoes because of the length of that password. Now, the second technique for hacking passwords is to use a dictionary attack, and that is to guess words, which is much more sensible because pe people tend to choose uh, their password based on things they know, places, names, football teams, that sort of thing. So 
we take advantage of that and we make a essentially it's just a notepad text file with one word on every single line just going down every english word french spanish german italian every name place football team etc the one i use the main one i use is about a million words long um which sounds like a lot but when you think about a single laptop it can run through a list uh, do a billion guesses per second it can run through that whole list a thousand times in a second so that allows us to start adding on variants to it. So we add numbers to the end of the ends of the words. We swap out um, A's for at signs, E's for threes. And we do it in the order of the way people most frequently choose their passwords when they think they're being clever by swapping out numbers and letters and symbols and letters and things like that. As hackers, we know all those techniques. So we, we just do the swaps in a sensible fashion. Run through that whole list a thousand times a second and very, very, very quickly break passwords. <clears throat> now, interestingly, I love green tomatoes still survives that process and that is because there aren't any dictionaries that use combinations of words in that fashion use sentences so the current advice from both me and from the government is to use passwords that are a combination of four or more random words or a sentence structure they don't do anything really really obvious so don't do you know nursery rhymes or my name is dave or anything really really simple um but use four random words or a sentence that's a bit funny difficult for people to guess and interestingly put one spelling mistake in it if you put a spelling mistake in one of that one of those words it means even if sentences start appearing in these dictionaries that hackers use they can't have every possible sentence with every possible misspelling of every word within that sentence because that will more or less be infinitely long Therefore, they're only left with the brute force technique, which in the case of I Love Green Tomatoes is longer than the age of the universe. So a four random word sentence with a spelling mistake in there is a very, very, very good password. Um, now, ideally, you'd have a different password for every website. That's quite difficult. You can use password manager tools that allow you to store your passwords centrally and then you unlock them with your, your fingerprint on your phone or something like that. And it fills all the passwords in for you. Or you can use a memory based system where you only have a very, very strong password for the websites that actually matter to you. So you think about it, there aren't that many websites that would truly be awful if they were hacked for you. But like your online banking would be the worst because then they can steal your money. Um, your, your social media pages wouldn't be great. Um, your online shopping accounts, uh, your personal email account and your work um, log on. There's just five areas where you might want a, a good password so we have five sentences that we use now it's only you've got to remember five passwords that's not too onerous for most people every other website you use that doesn't really store any personal data about you or if it does you can use fake data if they want your date of birth and things like that um, you can use whatever password you want i don't care it doesn't matter if they hack into it so for example you might have a password for for bbc iplayer and itv hub and sky and things like that does it really matter if a hacker breaks into those into your BBC iPlayer account? What are they going to do? Resume watching Match of the Day or whatever you're watching? You know, it doesn't actually matter. What matters is they take that password and then they then try it on your bank, knowing that most people share passwords. But if you don't share passwords with the, with the really sensitive stuff, the stuff that's important to you, then who cares if you lose your BBC iPlayer account and you just make a new one? It doesn't matter. Um, so that's how you only have to remember a handful of passwords. Now, combined with that, on those important websites, we use something called two-factor authentication. All big websites support this. It's where you get a separate code sent to your mobile phone when you log in. I'm sure you'd have seen it with your bank because um, they usually enforce that you use that. Um, so banks use it. Social media uses it. Most of the big online shops use it as well. It is much, much harder. Take it from someone that does hacking for a living. If you do that, put that code on, it makes it more or less impossible for us to hack. It's, we'd have to steal your phone at the same time or take control of your mobile phone account by phoning up and pretending to be you. It's that much more difficult to the point where we won't bother, to be honest. We'll go for people who haven't used it. So you put that protection mechanism in place with those strong passwords is very, very, very good. Last one, and I realize I'm telling you to go to a website after I've just told you about not following links and opening attachments. But if you do go to a website called Have I Been Pwned or just Google HIBP, you can check whether your um, email address and password have been hacked in the past um, and hackers have released that onto the internet. Now, all the time, hackers are constantly breaking into websites. They steal the passwords out of the database. They then publish them for other hackers to use. Um, so if you put your email address in there, you press go, it will show you if your email address has been used on a website and been hacked. And it will tell you when and whether the password was compromised or just the email address. And what we're worried about is when the password has been compromised. Now, that doesn't necessarily mean the password for the email account itself. What it means is you've registered 
on a website using that email address and the password you used for that website has been compromised. So you go and change the password for that website if, you, if it does go red for you on this, on this screen um, and any other website that uses that password. So you have to stop using that password from now on and you have to change it if it's being used anywhere else. Okay, um, last little section just to think about who might actually um, hack us and what the impact would be if they were successful. So first group, criminal gangs, they're the most likely. They use ransomware attacks, whaling, all the things I talked about earlier are mostly criminal, criminal gangs use. They're purely motivated by profit. You then have nation states, mostly China, North Korea, Russia, Iran, um, even the UK, the US have, have offensive cyber capabilities. They may look to break into companies to steal intellectual property for espionage, that sort of thing. Um, they may break into financial companies to steal systems, that, that sort of thing. Uh, you then have hacktivist groups who look to cause disruption, embarrassment to companies. So perhaps they target a financial institution because they're anti-capitalist and they deface their website. They put their face and logo all over your website, uh, which is highly embarrassing. You have to contact all your customers to say it's happened. It affects your brand and reputation. doesn't look good. Um, Insiders, that is anyone that works at the company can potentially be an attacker. Now, for the company you work for, you maybe you quite like working there and you're a good person, you don't want to hack them, you don't want to steal the information, which is you know, the vast majority of people. But what if you were influenced by one of the other groups? What if a criminal gang came to you and said, we'll give you £20,000 if you take this USB stick in at work and plug it in for us for a couple of days? Might be quite tempted by that. What if they gave it to the cleaner with, with, with 500 pounds? The cleaner has no um, loyalty to your company. They just come in and clean your desks and they're low paid. Give them 500 pounds, they might well crawl around under a desk and plug a USB stick in for you, especially if they don't really know what it's for. Uh, last group is, in, is individual hackers. That's anyone that, that generally the, what the media portrays as a hacker. So 15 year old kids wearing um, with tattoos, with pink hair and listening to techno music, that sort of thing. The sort of traditional um, media view of a hacker. Um, but they can be very effective because most companies are not very difficult to break into. So even, even those guys can still break into companies. Um, Talk Talk were broken into a few years back, mobile phone provider and, and internet provider, and they were broken into by a, a 17 year old kid um, who just learned some basic hacking stuff off of YouTube uh, and tried it on them. And the first thing he learned actually worked on their website and he was able to hack them. Um, so even, even basic um, hackers can sometimes break into companies because they don't know what they're doing. <clears throat> and the impact of a, of a hack. So first thing is damage to brand and reputation. So if you have to go out to your customers and clients and say, we've been hacked into, we've lost all of your personal details, your email address, your, your passwords, perhaps even your ID scans, your passport scans, if you had to provide that for them. Uh, really sorry about that massive impact on your brand and reputation that customer is probably going to leave you new customers aren't going to come to you etc you also have to reveal to the information commission's office the ico that you have uh, suffered a data breach and therefore they may well choose to fine you um so two one uh, two big ones the last year were the b uh, british airways and marriott uh, hacks that led to huge fines uh, or intentions to to do huge fines under gdpr legislation Prior to GDPR, the biggest fine you could levy was 500,000. Now you can go up to 4% of the company's turnover. So for BA, it was about 1.5% of their turnover. So best part of 200 million pounds, a huge, huge amount of money. Um, this slide just sums up what I've talked about today. Um, we start off as a criminal group with background research. We use social media mostly. We use that to construct a social engineering attack, whether it be phishing attacks, whether it be in person, whether it be over the phone. We use that to take control of a computer on the network. We move around the network. This is where the technical stuff takes over that I don't get a chance to talk about in, the, in these sorts of sessions. We steal information. We find a way of making money from it, whether that's ransomware, encrypting everything on there and asking for money back, or we sell the information itself might be worth something. We sell that and then hopefully we get away without getting caught. Uh, so you can help by doing various things. So the first thing to look after both your own personal data and that of a company you work for is to look after your social media profiles and make sure they are secure in the, in the way I described earlier. Uh, look out for phishing attacks using the methods I talked about earlier, looking for that, that emotional response, looking for urgency, weird email addresses, bad spelling and grammar, generic greetings, that sort of thing. Um, look out for people wandering around the building you work in that you don't recognize, make sure you don't let people just follow in behind you. 
Um, and in terms of passwords, make sure you are using those nice long sentences I talked about combined with two-factor authentication and checking that um, HIBP website that I talked about as well. Um, and that concludes this session. Thank you everyone for joining me. Thank you for listening. Um, my email address is up there. If you want to have a go at phishing me, you're more than welcome. Um, or I've got my Twitter profile there as well if you want to uh, follow me. I have, to, I have to not follow my own advice for, for media work. I have to have an open Twitter profile. So you can use that to have a go at hacking me as well if you like. Um, but other than that, I am done. Thank you very much um, for listening. Um, if there are any questions now, I will quite happily take them. I can't say thank you enough. I mean, this is this is really interesting, and it's it's unfortunate that we couldn't have you live. Uh, I mean, we had you live, but have you like? In front of yeah, the, Ho hopefully later on year, yeah, when this is all blown over, we can uh, how, we can do a live. How would you get into this? And also, so before I go there, like Dashlane and some of these other password managers, because I know that they they'll because um, I use one. I probably shouldn't have shared that with you. Now you can hack, but the um um I've all I've often been concerned about that primary password, right? Yeah. If you know I'm using it, then you get that primary. Now you have access to everything, which I guess then yeah. sets up the two the two factor. Um, yeah, I mean, what two, do you think yeah, about those as, in general? I mean, um, I I think if you are technically reasonably savvy and you know how to choose a long password and you know you're aware enough of techniques about phishing attacks to not ever give it away, then they're fine. Um, for the general population that don't really care about cybersecurity and cybersecurity is just a thing that gets in the way, like passwords is an annoyance. Um, I find they can be, can be met with resistance in trying to implement them. Uh, a lot of people want to use a system that that's, doesn't involve them having to write them down in a, in a computer software, in a bit of software. So that's when I come up with that, came up with that memory thing where you just remember different passwords for the websites that mm -hmm. truly matter to you. And that's from the feedback I've had from doing training sessions over the years, that tends to be more well received than, than trying well, to force people to use password managers. Wouldn't you want to go hack those those databases i mean that's like a tra yeah. i can only imagine that's a fabulous database to try it, it is yeah it is a treasure trove yeah i mean there have been a couple of password managers that have been hacked in the past so cloud-based ones where the central database where they were all stored was hacked now they were encrypted passwords but mm. you can reverse that encryption if you know what you're doing it takes time and it uses the same sort of techniques I talked about in the password we were doing guessing around brute force and things like that um but it is doable so yes um in theory they are potentially vulnerable in practice. The bigger ones like Dashlane and stuff have very, very, very good security. The chance of them being hacked is, is very slim. Um, but it's, you know, it's obviously there's more chance than your brain being hacked, I suppose. But at least it does allow you to have very long passwords with different ones for every single website, which is an advantage. How did you, uh, my, my last question then will let yeah. everybody else, how, how did you get into this? Like, um, and, so, and yeah, why yeah. are you on the good side? Why are you on the good side? Of this? Yeah, great question. Um, so when I first started out, so originally my interest in it was, was uh, peaked at school when I started to do IT lessons and I, I basically just started playing around and hacking systems and things like that. I got a bit of trouble for it, uh, nothing major. And then I, I went away, did some, did a different degree. Uh, and then I came back and I did some um, software testing, which is basically just checking websites work. It's uh, part of the systems development process. Um, and I was looking for a new job. So I just typed in tester. Um, and one of the job titles that, that is sort of um, synonymous with um, ethical hacking is called penetration testing. Um, so I had a good laugh at the word penetration and then um, looked at the job description. I realized it was like a, a good version of what I'd been doing at school. Um, so they, at the time, the company I worked for, were looking for uh, someone new to the role who had good uh, English skills, good writing skills, because a lot of after you do a hack, you have to write up the report. And it's often actually harder to teach people writing skills than it is to teach them the technical skills. Um, so they trained me up in technical skills and I had the writing skills to, to write the reports. Um, and then from there, I spent a few years training and things and I got involved in the social engineering side. Um, and then the red teaming side um, beyond that. And now I run a team of, um, of about 15 um, hackers. Um, nowadays, so if we're talking about now how students can get into this sort of stuff, uh, there are lots and lots of training courses. Uh, there are university courses you can go to where you can learn ethical hacking. So there's ethical hacking countermeasures, digital forensics, loads of courses that lead into penetration testing. Even then, it's not essential. So some of the best employees that I've got in my team didn't come from that background. They came from completely strange backgrounds that then moved into pen testing because they found it very interesting. And it is a very, very interesting career. Um, so in my team, I've had an estate agent, 
Um, I've got an ex-professional basketball player in the team as well who came out of that career, thought, what am I going to do? Heard about penetration testing and bought a load of online courses and just started training himself up and then said, look, can you take a punt on me? I promise I'll, I'll, I'll work 12 hours a day, 14 hours a day to get myself up to speed. Um, and I find by employing people that have have that mindset that really really want to get into that field they, they work really really well um so nowadays you've got a choice of, of different ways in you 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 know you study in yourself and you prove to a company that you're worth taking a shot on or you go down the d degree route and you get yourself the, the right qualifications marion mike yeah, any, have, any questions? yeah i have one question on your uh, company business model i have heard about uh, bug bounty so when yeah. Uh, and so do you use uh, Bug Bounty as a, as a business model? So hacking a company that, uh, and then selling them how you hacked it and how they can resolve the hack, or do you, do you use another business model? Uh, no, so at the moment we don't, as a company, use that Bug Bounty type program. So we, we do the reverse of it. The company contacts us for a, a professional test to check their systems work they pay us an amount of money and then we then we test it um so we which is a slightly i suppose older model um but still much in demand um the bug bounty type programs usually suit uh individual hackers so if i was to not work for a company i currently i work for a company called phalanx um if i was to not work for them and i went solo I could look to do bug bounty either directly through so I could try and hack Facebook and they will give me money because as a company they offer a bug bounty program or I could go to a there's sort of, there's collections of, of bug bounty um, where a company will go to the to a, a bug bounty company and say will you test our website and then they'll sort of crowdsource thousands of hackers to come in you get paid per vulnerability that you find so that's kind of a, a new model that's got pluses and minuses but at the moment we're operating on, on on a model of we do a test at a set fee for a client as that that tends to work really well when you're operating a, a normal style business with employees and salespeople and that sort of stuff so so how often do you get busted um and what well happens? so on the on the physical side you mean specifically where we're breaking into the buildings yeah, yeah, yeah okay yeah. so very rarely um you get degrees of being busted to where you think I've gone so far. And if I go any further, I think I'm going to be busted. So you back off there and you, and you finish the job a little bit early and um, you get kind of get a sort of spidey sense for, for these things after a while. Um, we've I've had one job where I was completely busted uh, and it was very early in the job. Actually, it was during the reconnaissance of the building. Um, so I was just looking to do some um, taking photos of CCTV camera positions, entrances, and exits and things like that. And I thought I was in a public car park um, nearby. Um, it turned out that the company that I was testing had recently bought that car park and made it private and I hadn't realized it hadn't been updated on Google Maps and I'd been um, noticed as, as I was driving in and then when I didn't go straight to reception I sat in a car taking photographs uh, they were very suspicious and they came and basically dragged me out of the car because it was a very well protected company uh, and took me into a, a quiet room and said what are you doing wouldn't believe me when I said I was bird watching um, and they they asked me to um <clears throat> so said you know you, you need to come up with a reason otherwise we're we're gonna send you to get the police in uh, at that point i brought out the uh, the legal form that, that we have to reveal if we are caught um, but it's very very rare that's the only time i've been fully caught on one of these jobs and i've done yeah probably a good 200 or so uh, different buildings cool work mike you have any questions tony because i'm uh, conscious of time i've got a question so um you know like the the image of a hacker like you know, busily tapping away, but the, you know, the numbers scrolling on the screen is pretty cool. But if I'm a hacker, I want to automate as much as I can to make money while I sleep. Right. So oh, is there, is there like a, is, is there a risk of, of really like large scale automated hacking going on? Is that kind of thing just a threat? Like it's spinning all the time. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. In various different forms. So a lot of the tool tools that we use as hackers are, are automated so we automate portions of the discovery phase of a company of the 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 execution of the attack is it can be automated using tools um there's also a very very thriving um community on the dark web that do hacking um so if you're clever you make a business model where you develop ransomware software for example you then license it out to people who deliver it for you and you then take a cut of that 
which is what happened with Travelex. So the, the original authors of the ransomware weren't involved in that. They sold it to someone else who then, um, who then sent it out and did all the legwork. And now you just take a cut, say 30% of the, the profit that was made from that attack. So you can kind of become the, the, the sort of kingpin at the top that, that does all that. Um, in the future, we'll be looking at AI, AI based um, hacking attacks that, that learn how defensive systems work and find a way around them. Um, I've not seen any evidence yet. There's a lot of stuff in the cybersecurity industry about you know, machine learning and AI. And you look under the hood and it's really not that clever, to be perfectly honest, you, you wouldn't really call it AI. But it will get to that stage where we can completely automate an attack because it is a prescriptive process. You've got to be a little bit creative, but for most companies, the same style of attacks work every time so you could certainly automate even more than than we do at the moment so yeah it's a great a great point and and it's financially makes sense to to automate stuff so yeah it will increase well i'm conscious of time rob i really appreciate the time this is extremely helpful um if i ever get if if, if mike ever lets me out of quarantine i'll come down and buy you lunch at some point. Yeah. Um, good, and I know all of his I know all of his kids' names, so maybe you can help me hack into his bank account. <laughs> um, That's not much there, Alan. Just take it. I'll just give it to you. <laughs> <laughs> if it'll buy me five guys, we're good, right? Yeah, it's fine. So anyway, I'm gonna I'm gonna cut off recording, but I I really appreciate the opportunity to to get the talk. I think it's extremely helpful. Um and is it okay? Well we, you gave the email so for students, would you prefer they come through us to contact you for questions or um, no, I don't mind. They can go direct to me if they want to. That's fine. Okay, super. Well, I really appreciate that. Thank you. I'm going to kill, kill the recording now and then we can chat yeah. briefly.